Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Inside the Issue. As the day we talk about the integration of HER2 targeted treatment strategies into the management of gastroesophageal cancers. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Tony Saab from the uh, Mayo Clinic Cancer Center uh, in Mayo Clinic in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, and Dr. John Strickler from Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. We also recruited four other GI investigators to participate in a survey that we sent out this week of their usual treatment practices. We put the entire uh, survey in the chat room. If you want to take a look at it, we're going to show some of the slides from it as we go through tonight. If you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by our faculty, just type them into the chat room and we'll bring up as many of these as we have time. As in all of our webinars, we have a one-minute pre-meeting survey for you to take, and at the end of the meeting, if you take these, you'll get a lot more out of this experience. You know, a lot of people end up listening to our webinars, and while they're driving their cars or raking the leaves in this fall, if you're into audio programs, check out our Oncology Today series, including a program with Dr. Raghav, uh, looking at HER2-directed therapy and GI cancers as well. Next week, we'll be revving up uh, the uh, engine again for neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we haven't talked about that. I'm really looking forward to seeing what's up. And then uh, we'll be heading to the uh, SOHO meeting as we go to every year. We'll have two symposium there, one on CAR T-cell therapy in patients with NHL and CLL. Dr. Lunning will be moderating that. And also a program on diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that Chris Flowers from MD Anderson will be running there. We're going to be doing a webinar series this fall on CLL. We're starting out on the 17th with Matt Davids. We'll be presenting some cases by video in practice. Uh, just as a heads up, we have six programs set for the Big Ash meeting. Uh, so if you're heading to Ash this year, uh, check out uh, these programs or you can watch them online. But today we're here to talk about HER2 targeted treatment strategies and GI cancers. And of course, now with the pan tumor approval of trastuzumab deruxtecan, this is a consideration in almost every solid tumor. We'll talk about that, but really focus on uh, GI cancers. And if all, all of our meetings, we will be talking about non-FDA approved agents and strategies. So check out package insert for more information. As we do with a lot of our webinars, we had, I met with the faculty individually over the last couple of days, actually, to record a presentation and in-depth discussions. Uh, Dr. Strickler talked about uh, G upper GI and colorectal cancer, and Dr. Saab talked about biliary tract cancers. There are cases in there, tons of stuff. We just picked out a few of the things that I learned talking to these uh, two faculty people and to try to get more depth, and that's what we're going to do here today. Uh, so here are some of the topics uh, we're going to get into. We're going to start out just before we sort of race down the the data zone, so to speak. We were we were getting the uh, survey ready to send out to the faculty, and I sort of had a little bit of an inspiration to add an additional question to it. And so, first of all, for those of you who don't know, this actual layout that we use with the the docs on the side here, we got from Monday Night Football with Eli and Peyton Manning. The faculty always fight on who's going to fight on about who's going to be Eli and who's going to be Peyton. But for this program. Uh, we're actually trying something completely new from another uh, ESPN program. Actually, I think it's going off the air, pardon my interruption, where the speakers get 90 seconds to talk about key topics. So we thought it'd be fun to kind of get away from the ASCO thing of, you know, giving eight-minute talks to have given really 90-second discussions. And so we'll see how that works tonight. Uh, as we were preparing uh, for the, our survey, I decided to add another question. I was kind of reflecting back. This is my granddaughter getting ready for her first uh, day at pre-K. And I was just reflecting back of all the kids and grandkids over the years. I feel like I, going back to school is an unofficial holiday for a lot of us, I think. And so uh, I was curious. We actually decided to ask the faculty how many people they actually have, children, grandchildren, nieces, loved ones who are starting school again. I won't show you the individual answers of the faculty, but ought to say that the faculty has up to six children under the age of 18. Can you imagine getting six kids? It looks like twin, 14-year-old twins is part of that, one of the faculty. Everybody has kids except one uh, faculty person or maybe a little bit uh, 
Maybe they're beyond going to school. I was also thinking about, you know, our tour and how July 1st is like a magic number for us because that's the day we start interns. That's the day our fellowship. You know, if I'm a patient and it's in the summer, I'm always aware of, okay, these people just started last month. I Maybe I better be careful. <laughs> but anyhow, you know, it, it really, I know there's kind of a weird path of thinking, but it made me think a lot about GI cancers because, like, when I think about, young people with cancer. And a lot of the reason is actually one of the nurse practitioners that we work with for many years. I know, Tony, you know her as well. Jessica Mitchell, who's at the Rochester Mayo. We've been working with her for like 15 years, and she always presents young people with families, you know, incredibly complex. You all see this every day. I was flashing on what it's like to be on chemotherapy and have your kids start school, and that's something I'm sure you see a lot. So we're going to kind of start out here and test out this sort of part of my interruption thing with a back to school comment. And I'm going to start out with Tony. And you can see we have the timer here for Tony in 90 seconds. Anything you want to say about young people with GI cancer? And it's not just GI, of course, breast. We did a program uh, last uh, this past March in breast where one of the patients uh, had several, was diagnosed while being pregnant. And Joyce O'Shaughnessy was so eloquent talking about how people with small kids are like warriors, you know, they, they, they'll deal with any toxicity for any benefit. So Tony, just any thoughts about young people with GI cancers, everything from some of the psychosocial impact, sort of the biology of why we're seeing so many young people with uh, these cancers, Tony? Yeah, Neil, I mean, this is <clears throat> becoming a, a significant, uh, we call it epidemic, uh, although cancer remains uh, something that we see in older patients, but uh, it's really affecting a lot more younger patients, uh, younger families uh, with with children. You know, we don't clearly understand why we're seeing this epidemic in in younger uh, adults. Uh, but one of one of the thoughts is uh, that it uh, likely because uh, this is not a genetic issue. I mean, that's have been well documented that it's likely related to changes in the way we interact with our environment. And one of the direct uh, elements that uh, is affected by, by the environment, by what we eat, what we drink, uh, uh, is, is uh, the microbiome. And the thought is that, you know, the, the, the micro, micro, changing the microbiome, so, you know, you know, a lot of the food we eat, milk we eat, you know, may have antibiotics, growth hormones, or what have you, may actually affect the composition of the microbiome, and that may create a pro-inflammatory, pro-carcinogenic uh, milieu, which essentially elicits these cancers, and very healthy otherwise, uh, younger uh, younger adults. Now, in a lot of centers like ours uh, and others as well, you know, we think about those in a very specific way. Those are patients that have different needs. They have the young children. Uh, they have to think about fertility issues and others, so they they belong to a, a, a completely different pathway uh, of uh, of management. So, John, curious about your thoughts. I was going to ask. I remember a few years ago, Tony was talking about the microbiome. I see he has three kids still in uh, school, and he he kind of joked that he has his kids put their mouths on the doorknobs to get more of a microbiome, <laughs> you know, change the flora. And there, I don't know if he go if he really goes that far. Oh but, yes. Uh, and, <laughs> any thoughts? Uh, any thoughts? And actually, in the in the chat room, uh, uh, Missy says data shows that one in three hundred Americans have Lynch syndrome. That's a you know is that how much of an issue is uh, genetics uh, as part of this? John, any thoughts about young people with GI cancers? Yeah. So this early onset, particularly colon cancer, has been most widely documented, but we are seeing increased rates in other GI cancers as well, like pancreas and upper GI cancers. But this has been a challenge for us. There's been uh, now a lot of interest poured into what could be driving this. You know, to your point, one of the reasons why it's challenging is because it may not be something that we're exposed to. It may be something that we're not exposed to, right? You think about how humans live today and how humans live 200 years ago. You know, the nature of our relationship to our environment and to microbes is very different. We live in a sterile environment. And I think that it can be very challenging sometimes to identify a cause when it's something you haven't been exposed to, that maybe the, the body, uh, you know, over, over human history has been exposed to. So, you know, I, I think that um, 
this is there's still so much to learn in this area. One thing we do know is that this is not related to genetic predisposition. This is um, independent of genetics or germline alterations. So it is something that's happening. We just don't we don't have a clear explanation yet. So uh, let's uh, move forward in terms of some of the specific issues related to uh, HER2 uh, positive disease. And one of the things I want to start with, uh, you know, talking about uh, July 1st, there's a couple of slides that actually, John, I think developed thinking about fellows starting, mm -hmm. walking through his thinking about biomarkers. I mean, we've talked about biomarkers every possible way you can imagine in GI cancers over the last few years in the CME programs. But I really love the thinking that went into this slide. And I'm going to ask uh, John to go through the two slides that he did in his talk. And again, watch his talk. We go through it in depth. This is just a tasting menu here. Uh, so, John, maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of how you, th you think through and why you put the slides together this way for upper GI and colorectal. We'll let you talk about that, and then t I'll ask Tony to respond to it. So, John, can you walk us through the way you think about it? Yeah, so, you know, essentially, I, I developed these slides with my, with my fellows, my trainees in mind, and it's a challenge. Now we're dealing with multiple targets, and some of those targets are relevant to frontline therapy, and we also deal sometimes with limited tissue. So what I did here in this slide is to say, okay, this is what I would order first, this is what I would order second and third. For an upper GI cancer, the very first test that I would recommend is um, HER2 testing, ideally with IHC and FISH, that comes back fairly rapidly. And the reason is because that puts that patient down a certain pathway of her anti-HER2 therapies. Then once I get that HER2 result, assuming they're positive, I also need to know the PDL1 expression level. Because if they are PDL1 positive, then they're a candidate for immune therapy, in this case, pembrolizumab. But then there are other targets that are pertinent as well. So we also routinely test for MSI or mismatch repair. That can be done by various assays, either IHC, PCR, or NGS. And then at the bottom, I have these tumor agnostic biomarkers where we have FDA approvals for these, and they're listed in our guidelines, things like NTREC fusions, RET fusions, BRAF E600E. And those can be encapsulated in NGS. But I put those at the bottom because we wouldn't necessarily treat in front line with those therapies. And um, they also, because they're more rare, they're not as influential to our treatment algorithm. Now, we also have other biomarkers we could consider, specifically germline testing for a young patient. We also will sometimes order RNA sequencing. And then also there may be a role sometimes for the so-called liquid biopsy or blood NGS. So maybe I'll just hold off now before we get to colorectal cancer and ask for uh, uh, Tony's uh, thought about this. You know, this idea of suppose you have limited tissue, John presents a case in his uh, talk of a patient who had a, a CPS of 100%, IAC 3 plus, and had a CR and never had NGS done. So when I right. said, could you get a Signatera, you didn't have, you know, you couldn't do a bespoke, bespoke assay. But anyhow, any thoughts about the way he described it, uh, Tony? No, I mean, I think that's a, that's a, Pretty well described way. I, I think I personally would 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 prioritize MSI status in in all cancers, uh, metastatic as well, because we know we can we can cure. Uh, uh, and I, I use that that word uh, you know uh, cautiously, although in this case we do see cures with IO therapy. So I, I I think you know in our institution MSI and her two IHC are both automatically conducted on tissue before even I see the patient. Um, and, you know, we're starting to add PD1, PDL1 expression. So I think MSI, HER2, uh, IHC would be, would be certainly prioritized PDL1 expression. And I do agree that uh, the rest will really uh, need uh, enough tissue, uh, uh, additional tissue, uh, TMB high and track fusions, red fusions, BFE 600D and others. And the advent of uh, liquid biopsy has helped quite a bit with uh, limited tissue. There's a you know relative good concordance rate uh, with uh, GE cancers and 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 colorectal say so luminal cancers, and uh, and uh, tissue NGS about 80% concordance. So you can capture the rest 
uh, with a liquid biopsy. For the fusions, it's a bit tricky. Uh, you know, having RNA uh, certainly adds adds value. Now, there are some uh, liquid uh, 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 NGS, blood NGS, that are adding RNA. We still have to see, you know, how well they perform. They just got into the uh, the arena. So uh, here's a slide John put together for Colin and John. Before you, as you talk about that, I'll just say that in the chat room, Nick wants to know what kind of biomarkers you use when a patient in a perioperative setting is going to who has resectable disease. And Rubing yeah. wants to know what about genetic testing. You talk about younger patients. What what age or triggers you to do genetic testing? Yeah, so um, great point. Um, in the perioperative setting, somebody being treated with curative intent, there I would put MSI or mismatch repair at the top. So that on that prior slide that I showed, this is the colon cancer slide, but on the prior slide, I would actually look at it very differently for somebody in that perioperative setting. And there, um, to Tony's point, it's really mismatch repair MSI that drives drives that. Germline testing, I also had there, and yes, I am definitely thinking about germline testing in a patient under 50. Also, you know, if we're talking about gastric cancer, for example, we do see, um, we can see Lynch syndrome with gastric cancer. We can also see CDH1 germline mutations, which is a rare hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome. So it's something to be aware of. Um, and then there are other uh, polyposis syndromes that can manifest as um, as upper GI cancers. So I would keep that in mind, absolutely. Uh, so if I may, so for, for germline testing, I would say do it universal and across all ages. I mean, we published data on that on 3,000 plus patients. And we were surprised to see that even patients in their 70s, 80s, which where you would expect the cancer not to necessarily be linked to genetics, that we find quite a quite a sizable number of patients that actually do exhibit uh, 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 germline mutations, which does affect treatment, but may affect their families. But I also would add that for about 15 to 20 percent of the patients who don't fit your typical NCCN guidelines uh, or other gui national guidelines of high risk for uh, uh, genetic alterations, we found that those patients. Uh, can harbor actually genetic uh, germline alterations. So, you know, we, we do it pretty universally, regardless of age, regardless of risk for all patients that get through the door. So I'm going to move on in a second to some other issues. Um, one in particular that I that came up that was pretty new to me, and I have a feeling it's going to be new to a lot of people. I'm going to re resist the temptation to uh, ask you about Dilip in the chat room, asking about what about neoadjuvant, trastuzumab, and Pembro. Let's not even get started with that. I know you had a negative trial. Everybody always is asking the same question. But moving forward, John, just sort of off the top of your head, using the same kind of, and we put this together, really. I'm, yeah, you know, this yeah. is not exactly your slide. But how do you think through biomarkers with biliary, John? Yeah, so here, um, now, we, we joke around. We say biliary tract cancers are like the new lung cancer right? Uh, there are so many actionable targets. We're now seeing that pie slice down. Um, you know, in terms of what I, the first thing I do when I see a patient with a new diagnosis of biliary tract cancer is an NGS test. Um, and, and that's be, to capture all those targets simultaneously. Now, I will say MSI mismatch repair is also critically important. And that one I would put way up the ladder as well. Um, however, that could also be captured in an NGS test. Um, certainly, HER2 will be captured out of, uh, out of an NGS panel. The challenge is that the current FDA approval that we've got for HER2 positive biliary tract cancers is for IHC3+. Plus. So then the question is, when are you going to order that, right? I'd probably put that after the NGS test. So if the patient had HER2 amplification, ERBB2 amplification out of a tissue NGS, then I would send the HER2 IHC test. And then, of course, we've got all these tumor agnostic biomarkers that are relevant in second and third line, which are shown here, things like KRSG12C, BREF E600E, and others. So we actually uh, just recorded a two-hour program with a pathologist <laughs> just talking about HER2 testing. Just That's all we talked about for two hours. So we'll get into some of the things. And one of the things that I see a lot of questions about, a lot of confusion about, is the information we get from NGS, Tony, in terms of HER2, because they do report amplification, 
when general medical oncologists, when they hear amplification, they think breast cancer, fish, amplification of two. But you were explaining to me that the way they do with NGS is different, and the number actually in an NGS test is six. So for practical purposes, that's sort of the same as two in breast. Do you want to elaborate on that, Tony? Yeah, you know, for NGS, what, what they're reporting is HER2 copy number, not as much as the HER2-17 ratio, which, you know, would be accurate to say more equal than two would be considered, uh, uh, you know, positive. Uh, now, the good news is that you don't have to think too much about it. It's pretty much standardized. If, uh, you know, the NGS, as, you know, John uh, has it in his, uh, in his responses, if NGS... Uh, reports back uh, positive, that typically means that they, it's, it's more or equal than six. So you don't have to remember the number as much, uh, but if you'd like to, just remember it. Uh, so so it's, it, 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 it correlates quite, quite well, uh, and that, that's pretty much you know, the difference when you say uh, you know, amplification by NGS or amplification you know, by using fish, so the numbers uh, reflect a ratio in one, in, in one, which is the fish, and a copy number in the other, which is NGS, or HER2. So let me just read you uh, an entry that just came into the chat room from Daniel. Okay. Imagine, a patient who's, imagine a patient who's sort of run out of options and what, what a patient like this might have been facing a couple of years ago and how things change. I have a patient, and we can talk about this later, but I just want you to keep this in your mind. I have a patient with metastatic gastric cancer, MS stable, and second line TDXD after full FOX has had an amazing response so far. Should I continue indefinitely until progression? Should I continue cardiac echo every three months, rebiopsy, blood NGS upon uh, progression? Um, so let's just keep that in mind. And actually, I think, uh, John, you have a case of a patient also doing well in the the question will also get into people who don't do well and particularly toxicity, but just amazing to think about a patient now who's now, you know, we're mm -hmm. getting to the issue of, do we stop? Also, what about pulmonary screening and patients that have been a long time? So we'll kind of keep that in mind, but I want to get into this. This is the thing that I learned a lot about. I'd heard about it, but I did not understand it. And I'm guessing there may be a lot of people out there because I knew there was some kind of connection between RAS mutation and anti-HER therapy. And these two people explain it to me. So I want them to explain it to you. And I think it kind of gets captured in this uh, question we asked, uh, Tony, which is uh, to what extent do people look at RAS mutation when they're trying to decide about uh, the use of anti-HER therapy? You say that you look at it very carefully, I know in their talk you go into this, you both say you look at it in colon and biliary, but not in GI. I'm going to ask you to explain it. You can see the heterogeneity within the faculty, so you know we're kind of on the cutting edge. But Tony, when I heard you all explain it, it reminded me of some of the thinking we went through about EGFR inhibitors, the fact that they need to be RAS wild type because there's like a ligand independent receptor activation that bypasses what you're blocking when you give trastuzumab, tucatinib, and some of these other agents. And the concept that in, peop in people who do have RAS mutations, that they're not necessarily going to respond to sort of metabolic, you know, pathway blocking, but they do respond if you have a bomb that's attached to the receptor that explodes when it gets there, uh, or chemotherapy itself. So we'll do a little, uh, pardon my interruption, I'll give you 90 seconds to talk about something you could talk about for two hours. Tony, give us a little bit of a flavor. Again, think about the fellows who just started about what this is all about. So, so we always have to think about, uh, you know, the, the, the pathways that have some level of uh, interaction and what that means. So HER2 activates essentially the RAS MAPK pathway. Uh, and there's close, uh, close uh, and interlinked interactions between the two. So the MAPK pathway does include RAS and BRF. Now, most of the data we have, and we've had that at least clinically, it was with the RAS and HER2 in colorectal cancer. And it becomes very obvious that in the presence of a RAS mutation uh, and a HER2 amplification, agents that specifically target 
And then when I say specifically target, that's agents like trastuzumab, tucatinib, and others, not trastuzumab, they're oxtecan. I know we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Those that really want to shut down the activity of HER2, lose their activity uh, because of this parallel activation. In fact, we also know that uh, one of the mechanisms of resistance to sustained HER2 blockade, and again, we're talking about HER2 amplifications, not mutations, just to be very careful about the difference. In the, uh, when you're targeting HER2 amplification, and one of the escape mechanisms, in addition to MET amplification and other, would be uh, acti- uh, 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 alterations in, in the RAS pathway, so RAS mutations, PIK3CA mutations. Uh, and, and, and we have some data with the BRAF mutations. It's not as well established. And that applies... The reason why I put colorectal cancer and biliary cancer, because we know in those cancers we have a, a, a substantial percent of patients, more in colorectal, less in biliary, that actually have RAS mutations and VRAF mutations, not as much in gastroesophageal cancers. So, um, John, I'm curious about your thoughts. And also, just to mention uh, one of the cases you presented at, uh, during uh, the talk you did recorded was a patient who, like a lot of patients, got the Mountaineer regimen first for metastatic disease, did not have any RAS mutation, and got that regimen successfully for 14 months, progressive disease, flips over to TDXD, and is still on it three years later. So I guess sort of following an algorithm that some people take, you know, I, I don't know exactly in terms of specific preferences in RAS wild type tumors. But, you know, looking at this, you would think, at least in this patient, it looks like maybe there's more efficacy with the TDXD. Any thoughts about sequencing? And if, John, if you do have a RAS mutation, does that rule out like trastuzumab, pertuzumab, ducatinib? Yeah, so what what I will explain to a patient is that when you you think about RAS and its impact on on a cancer cell, I mean, imagine you walk in a room and you've got a light switch and the light's on and you want to turn the light off. And that light switch is HER2, right? So you should flip the switch, shut down HER2, and the light should turn off. But the light doesn't turn off. It stays on even though you flip the switch off. So something has happened between that switch and the light bulb to keep it turned on. And in that case, it's something, and in this case, it would be like a RAS mutation or a BRAF mutation or even a meta amplification will keep the light on even when you turn off that HER2 switch, right? So, what that argues for is you need a different way to turn that light switch off. And, and I think that one of the advantages of trastuzumab direct secan in that setting of a RAS mutation or a BRAF mutation is all it needs is HER2 expression to get into the cell and um, cause cytotoxic results for that cell. And so this is a very common pattern of resistance. Uh, what we see to tucatinib and trastuzumab is typically the gain of one of these mutations, either a KRAS, NRAS, BRAF mutation, sometimes MET amplification, is a classic pattern of resistance, but there's usually no loss of HER2 expression. And if there's one thing we know about trastuzumab direct stecan for colon cancer, you need the HER2 expression to get in the cell. So as long as there's HER2 expression, it doesn't matter what kind of mutation might also be present. It still works. Um, but, you know, clearly there are trade-offs in toxicity between the therapies. And if you're going to be on a therapy for several years, you'd rather be on the least toxic regimen, which in my experience is tecatinib and trastuzumab. But it's nice to have the fallback plan of, t- of trastuzumab directs TCAN in case the, the tumor does acquire one of these alterations. So we're going to pick up on some of the things that you all talked about going through the specific cancers. We're not going to do uh, everything. We combined uh, some of the survey data together. Here you see the global strategy. Now, we said right now, uh, in general, where do you bring anti-HER therapy in in a patient who has, quote, HER2 positive? We didn't define it, but you know, I think here we think about at least IC3+. plus. And you can see that obviously upper GI cancers, we have the famous 811 study uh, showing the, the addition of Pembro to the uh, TOGA regimen of chemo trastuzumab. So everybody, of course, picks up on that. But uh, uh, Tony, uh, uh, in terms of colon and biliary, we're thinking second line. One thing I thought was just kind of interesting is we said, well, put re- aside reimbursement. When would you actually like to use anti her therapy? And you see a number of people, and particularly you two, like flipping and wanting to use it earlier. Tony, what are you thinking? What is it that you want to use earlier? 
And what's the trial that's going to let you do that? So the for colorectal cancer, you know, as, as John mentioned, you know, we have Mountaineer 3, which the two of us are, are part of the leading uh, investigators on that trial, uh, that's looking at chemo plus. Although John and I, again, synergize on the fact that you may not need chemotherapy. With uh, with trastuzumab ducatinib, you can see responses up to 50 to 60 percent in refractory patients if you have three plus. That's pretty significant, and these are durable responses. Mm -hmm. John presented the data at ASCO uh, uh, that essentially showed with updated data that the duration of response is, is a little bit north of 16 months, and that's in the more refractory side. You can't even achieve that with uh, a, you know any regimen other than MSI high and and pembrolizumab. You don't see that today with any any regimen, and so if I if I had my choice outside of a clinical trial, I, actually I want to go for the clinical trial. But if I had my choice, I'm going in colorectal cancer. I'm going for, to trastuzumab to catenib. With biliary tract cancer, if you look at response rates, durability of response, BFS, all parameters that we measure success with. Uh, you never achieve a response rate more than 20 to 30 percent. You never achieve durability of response or PFS or S that's meaningful. When you look at biologics and specifically HER2 target therapies, your response rate is, is 40 to 50 percent. In fact, with the IC3 plus up to six is 56, 58 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so bringing, bringing again HER2 target therapy sooner, uh, is, is one will, will likely benefit the patient more meaningfully, but two also, cut down significantly on the relative toxicities from chemotherapy uh, on the longer run. So the next uh, question that I'm going to throw to uh, John because he covered it in his talk, and I don't know, my brain just is not capable of understanding the difference between gastric and breast HER2, yeah. but it got a little bit closer after I saw this slide. Well, So John, give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you you correctly pointed out that, hey, wait a second, breast and gastric are the same. What's the difference here? Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think I do owe you an explanation around that as well. But uh, let's back up here first. Um, you know, for colon cancer, there is no standard mm -mm. Um, routine standard of care way to stain for HER2. And there was the Heracles trial built their own colon cancer specific assay, but that Although that has some consensus, it's not broadly adopted in the United States. So now we have to choose between breast or gastric criteria. Now, breast cancer has different kinds of criteria. There you're looking for complete membranous staining um, in more in 10% or more tumor cells. Gastric cancer is different under a microscope. It's much more heterogeneous, and there's no HER2 expression on the luminal edge of the cell. So there you're looking for incomplete staining in 10% or more of the tumor cells, um, and, and that gastric criteria does account for some of that heterogeneity that is common in, in gastroesophageal cancers. So I, I the bottom line is, if your pathologist calls you up and says, which criteria do you want to use, breast or gastric, I would generally favor gastric for colorectal cancer. It's got a more similar pattern as, um, as gastric, um, but it actually doesn't matter. The concordance between the two assays is perfect in our Mountaineer study where we found a positive is a positive by both breast and gastric, a negative is a negative by both breast and gastric. That works for me. And let me just say to uh, KS and Theodora and others in the chat room who submitted some fantastic cases that not necessarily about her too. We will get you answers to those, but not today. And we'll let you know what people say, but uh, really great cases. Appreciate it. And I uh, want to ask Tony, you know, uh, we, I think we've all familiar with the Mountaineer data, but I just love this uh, slide here. It really gets into the idea of resistance and um, you know, we were talking about KRAS and NRAS, which you see all the way to the left. So these are people who progressed on Mountaineer. Is that right, John? That's right. So on this slide, what you're looking at are patients who um, had a blood NGS, in this case, Garden 360, collected at the time of progression. So each row here represents an individual patient, and we stacked it from longest progression-free survival at the top to shortest progression-free survival at the bottom. Each color represents a different type of alteration. Red is a gain of an amplification. Blue is a gain of a mutation. And black is loss of amplification. And you can see some really interesting patterns about what happens to a patient who progresses on tocatinib and trastuzumab. Most of the time, they acquire an alteration. 
Um, mm -hmm. The most common gain of amplification is MET, MET amplification, which interestingly, we now have uh, drugs in development for this that are highly active. But we also see a lot of acquired PIK3CA mutations, which I know is also seen in, in breast cancer. And then also we'll see um, acquired KRAS and NRAS mutations, which can be more problematic to treat. But, um, but what this also tells us very importantly is loss of HER2 amplification was only seen in two patients out of this whole data set. It's very uncommon to lose HER2 amplification which actually points to what to do next, right? If you haven't lost HER2 amplification, that means you've got a way in for this drug, trastuzumab directs TCAN, which is highly active in patients who retain high levels of HER2 expression. So it really speaks to that complementary strategy between ticatinib trastuzumab and trastuzumab directs TCAN. Tony, anything you want to say about the, the destiny trials uh, that looked at TDXD uh, in colorectal cancer um, and what your take is from a practical perspective in terms of using this drug? Yeah, you know, the, the way I would think about trastuzumab that I've taken and as, as you know, has been discussed now quite a bit that with trastuzumab that I've taken is more, more directed targeted chemotherapy. So it's still a chemotherapy agent. I mean, the, the cytotoxic warhead is the chemotherapeutic agent, but you're just targeting specifically to her to, to her two expressing tumors. So it docks and then and then it releases its its load into the tumor. Now Destiny CRC01 was followed by Destiny CRC02. CRC01 that show you know very promising results in patients essentially with col colorectal cancer. It's very important to understand that with Dest with trastuzumab deroxtecan, patients were allowed to have previous exposure to other other agents such as say trastuzumab to catenib or trastuzumab pertuzumab or lapatinib, which makes sense because with the with the prior you're targeting specifically the receptor and its activity. Here, as John alluded to, all what you care about is the expression. If it if HER2 is expressed, you have your docking station and you can release abundantly your chemotherapy into the tumor. So it makes sense also that 3 plus would do better than 2 plus and probably in this disease, I know breast may be different, but in this particular disease, 1 plus doesn't in invite enough uh, of, the, of the cytotoxic agent into the tumor to produce a meaningful response. So more expression, more response. But then the mutational status like RAS, pic 3 ca and others doesn't matter here because you're not caring about biology. Final word about this. So 6.4 mg per kg were tested in CRC01 had a lot of toxicities, so the thought was, let's bring it to 5.4 mg per kg. CRC02 did show that you get less toxicities, you get at least equivalent activity, but certainly see less, uh, less toxicity. It does not forego interstitial lung disease. You see less of it, uh, but certainly it still represented close to 8% of the patients. And actually, there was a similar study in non-small cell. I was going to mention to you when you present the same thing, lower dose, less toxicity, same efficacy. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit again. Go, please go to these presentations for all the details. Again, just a little bit of a tasting menu. Uh, John, I don't think we need to say too much about the Keynote 811 study. I guess the big thing, you know, as soon as I saw, we saw the response rate was better. Everybody was on board. But I guess the tricky thing there was 85% of those patients who were HER2 positive were also PD-1 positive. And when they pulled out the 15%, it looked like they didn't benefit. So they had to kind of modify the original um, uh, indication to be uh, PD-1 positive. But again, John, can you comment on where TDXD right now and where anti-HER therapy fits into upper GI cancers? So, um, you know, it, I, I think it's important to set the stage for that discussion. So for many years, all we had was trastuzumab approved. There were a number of agents studied for upper GI cancers, lapatinib, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, TDM1 were all studied, were all negative. TDXD made it, and, and it really made it out of the Destiny Gastric-01 trial. Here, this was conducted mainly in East Asia, South Korea, and Japan, where they randomized patients to standard third-line or later chemotherapy versus TDXD, the primary endpoint was response rate, and you can see a pretty dramatic improvement in response rate, 51% for TDXD versus 14% with physician choice chemotherapy. And um, additionally, 
they had some exploratory cohorts where they were looking at low and intermediate expressing tumors. And there are some hints here that maybe this, in this particular GI cancer, this one may be the exception to the rule, there may be some activity in these low and intermediate expressing cancers, um, you know, for TDXD. So specifically 26% response rate, small group of patients, uh, only 19 patients, but 26% um, response rate there for patients that were IC2 plus ish negative. And then in the lowest level of HER2 expression, one plus fish negative response rate was down at 9.5%. And of course, with such a small number of patients, we want to see more data. You know, it took right. a while for the HER2 low thing to play out in breast cancer. People, I guess, weren't expecting it. It is interesting though, you know, this is IC2 plus ish negative, and at least there are a few responses. So we'll see, hopefully we'll, see a lot more of that in breast cancer you know it expanded the use of tdxd like 40 percent an incredible effect on clinical practice uh tony anything else you want to say about uh anti-her therapy and also well I, i'll just refer you to john's talk where he gets into all the mechanisms of resistance anything else you want to add to that uh, tony J just very briefly on the hurt too low uh, I would, I would, I would just caution us that we, 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 we may see responses, but they seem to be mostly reported in studies that originate from Asia. Uh, that's true also for biliary tract cancer. There may be a different biology, uh, similar to perhaps closer to breast cancer because it's, uh, it's, uh, somewhat parallels that. So I would say that perhaps uh, when looking at, at studies from, uh, uh, from Asia, that her too low, uh, uh, may may actually predict for some level of response, albeit as John showed, it's a small level of 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 improvement. I'm not sure that in our Western uh, patient population we're going to see that benefit. So uh, going back to the survey, we see when we say just checking in to see what we say CPS is zero, and of course nobody uses Pembro nowadays, although they did it a couple of years ago. Um, in terms of second-line treatment in patients with HER2-positive disease, this is how we do a consensus. We ask everybody what they do. If they all do the same thing, we call it a consensus. If they do three different things, then, well, that's something else. But we try to tease it out a little bit here. Uh, what about in biliary tract cancer? Uh, we were talking about, you know, that it's sort of the new uh, lung cancer in terms of potentially uh, potential targets, although... Tony brought up the potential caveat about how effective they really are going to be. It does look, uh, John, uh, like uh, the Mountaineer approach has some benefit with biliary tract cancer. What's been your experience there, John? Yeah, so uh, it, it is undoubtedly active for patients who have HER2 positive biliary tract cancers. And once again, to achieve response, you know, promising response rates, progression-free survival that looks very promising in a group of patients without even giving chemotherapy, that's, that's, a, that's a big win for patients. You know, understanding that many of these patients are quite sick in second line or later. Um, maybe they've come off a, a long run with gemcitabine and cisplatin. It is really nice to offer a chemo-free regimen uh, for patients. Um, and, and the quality of life benefits can't be understated. So, uh, any comment, uh, Tony, about CNS issues? You know, when we, mm -hmm. general oncologists hear the word tucatinib, the first thing they think about is CNS meds, the Herclime regimen, which had so much activity. Now that we're seeing benefit in the brain from TDXD, I think there's a little bit of a reconsideration of that. How often do we see uh, CNS uh, metastases in, uh, in GI cancers in general? But what about HER2 specifically, Tony? I, I think so, I, somebody mentioned to me that it, her her two new was the original thing. It was it was called her two new. I didn't know this, but I think Dennis Slayman made it up because the new was neuro neurologic. Yeah, it was yes. that brain mets. I didn't yes. know that. Yes. So there's you know in in <laughs> it is. So it's a it's a good lesson in history. But you know, GI cancers overall, we don't see as much brain metastases, uh, but. Then when you look at HER2 positive, uh, 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 colorectal cancer, uh, HER2 positive gastroesophageal cancers, not, not as much, I haven't seen it as much in biliary tract cancer. You do actually see a higher propensity of metastases that involve uh, uh, the brain. 
Uh, and I'd say, you know, it depends on what you look, where you look at. It's, it's about five to 10% perhaps in HER2 positive colorectal cancer. Uh, in gastroesophageal, it's higher actually. Could be up to 15 plus percent. So there's a high propensity. And, and, you know, perhaps a theoretical advantage for the use, uh, of, uh, of tucatinib, which, which does, you know, cross, uh, effectively the blood-brain barrier and may have activity in, in patients with CNS disease. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, collected that data, right, uh, John, in, in Mountaineer? We, don't, we didn't have baseline uh, brain metastasis, uh, brain scans, I'm sorry. So, so we haven't had that data. Uh, there, there had been some data from the Heracles study, which does in, indeed show you know, that there is that increased risk. But we have that also from other data sets. So colorectal, gastroesophageal, HER2 positive, you will see a higher than normal uh, risk of developing brain metastases versus uh, non-HER2 amplified uh, GI cancers. So, uh, John, I decided to give you a, a, a memory test. This is what we do. <laughs> this is how we do it. I'm going, to I'm going to give you three questions from the chat room. You have to remember them all and give them the answer in 90 seconds. Okay, here we go, all John. All right. All right. You can't write it down. You can't write it down. No, you can write it down. It's fine. All right. So Brian wants to know, what do you think about combining tucatinib and TDXD as they do in breast cancer? Mm -hmm. KS wants to know, uh, if you have a patient who has IHC3 plus and uh, amplification, is that enough? He had a lung cancer patient who was amplified, but the insurance refused it until he got an IHC, and luckily it came back 3 plus. So the question right now today, we have a approval if it's three plus in colorectal cancer. I'm not sure beyond, beyond that. And then finally, something I never thought about, but Hassan brought up, what about patients who are resistant to arena TCAN? Does that affect activity of TDXD? Yeah. So uh, let's start with the first question. Does irena TCAN uh, cause resistance to TDXD? I, I will answer that. We, we've seen no evidence of it. Um, in any of our studies in the GI cancers, um, there does not appear to um, it does not appear to impact impact the sensitivity to to that drug. Thankfully, um, with respect to this question about um, amplification and access to therapy, I think this is a really great question. It's actually probably for all of us in the clinic one of the most relevant questions we'll face. We get an NGS test. It shows ERBB2 amplification. Am I done? Can I just give the drug or do I have to do the IHC? Currently, the FDA approval is for IHC3 plus only for trastuzumab directs TCAN. And the reason for that is that um, there are certain tumor types that are uniquely insensitive to trastuzumab directs TCAN when that IHC is 2 plus fish positive. One of those cancer types is colorectal cancer, where we see very few responses, where it's IHC2 plus fish positive. Lung cancer, of course, we know has uh, some resistance to the anti-HER2 therapies. Um, biliary tract cancers, minimal responses to TDXD, where it's IHC2 plus fish positive. Actually, if you look at the TDX data from uh, Destiny Pan Tumor, it's like 56% response rate in IHC3 plus. Um, so I do think we should reflex any ERBB2 AMP and NGS over to IHC testing. And then the combination of decatinib and trastuzumab directs TCAN, we have not, we have not looked at that in GI cancer. So that, that question is unanswered. So, well, you're the, the champion so far. You did all three of those questions in 90 seconds. So uh, pardon your interruption. Beautiful job. So, uh, Tony, I want to get into toxicity, particularly there's so much discussion about TDXD, but let's start out uh, with tucatinib and trastuzumab, the uh, uh, Mountaineer approach. I'll try to pull up the slide while you talk about, I don't want to ask John uh, because he, he, you know, it's his study, I mean, your study as well, but what is your experience with tolerability, uh, Tony? You know, a lot of people had experiences in breast cancer with lapatinib, neratinib, not the easiest tolerated TKIs. What do you see in uh, GI cancers with Mountaineer? Yeah, and uh, the experience is pretty much this, uh, very similar whether we're looking at uh, biliary cancer or colorectal cancer, Mountaineer and, and, and uh, the SGN0, uh, 019. Uh, to, you know, to him, unlike uh, lapatinib and ratinib and others, is, is highly specific for her to has actually very little uh, background noise. And so it doesn't have the typical HER1 toxicities that you see also with lapatinib. So it's a very clean, 
agent. So, and 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 on the study and our experience has been very consistent that the risk of toxicities is actually uh, pretty low. Uh, most toxicities are grade one and two. Uh, in fact, there are very few grade three toxicities. So the most common toxicity that we see is diarrhea and then followed by fatigue. And, 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 and diarrhea tends to be actually controllable. Um, for most patients, controllable with supportive measures. For some, you have to reduce the dose. Uh, fatigue, fatigue, uh, the same. So GI toxicities, fatigue, uh, uh, but, but mostly actually very well tolerated. And, you know, both, uh, John and I have patients who have gone for two, three, even John, I think has a patient who's been five plus years mm -hmm. and just doing fantastic, tolerating this extremely well. So overall, the experience is very positive, uh, with, uh, with the toxicities. I think unlike other, uh, oral TKIs that we've dealt with. Getting back to the case from the chat room from Daniel, the patient who owns second line TDXD for gastric cancer, who's uh, doing really well. I don't know exactly how long the patient's been on. Maybe if you want to put that in the chat room too, but it sounds like a long time. Uh, well, let's start with that and then we'll get into some of the problems that can occur. This patient sounds like they do, they're doing very well. But John, any thoughts about you have your patient is, uh, three years on TDXD. I don't know if that's, possibility of stopping it came up. I guess your patient had some epistaxis, but otherwise it seems like the patient yeah. did very well. Yeah. Um, before we get into more detail about how you look for and manage toxicity, what about long-term use and stopping anti-HER therapy? You know, uh, John and breast cancer, they never stop it. They get 10 lines of therapy and they still do it. What about here, uh, cell-free DNA? Is that ever something that you might consider in this scenario? Well, in the case that I presented, that patient still does have pretty substantial hepatic metastatic disease. And um, I, I am thoroughly convinced that if we were to stop the trastuzumab durex TCAN, we would see uh, it, it would be a problem for that patient. Um, also, she's tolerating it well. We did have to dose reduce below 5.4 mg per keg to manage some of the um, chemotherapy related toxicity. So, you know, I, I think that that's one scenario where we have had this come up with tocatinib and trastuzumab is we have had durable, complete responses lasting literally years. And that patient, and in that case, we have ordered MRD testing to understand whether there's anything left. And I, so I have heard of it used in the Mountaineer context of tocatinib trastuzumab, but not TDXD. Um, you know, obviously toxicity is the main concern. There are, uh, unfortunately, deaths related to trastuzumab drix TCAN. That ILD pneumonitis signal is very real, very serious. Um, we're screening every visit for cough, shortness of breath. We're getting scans, of course, every two to three months as part of restaging and have a low threshold to stop or suspend treatment if there's any signs of ILD or pneumonitis. We will also get baseline pulmonary function tests on all of our patients just in case there is a, a change so that we could potentially document that change uh, in the context of ILD or pneumonitis. But that's something that we just do at our institution that's not evidence-based. Yeah, I mean, your institution studied that, and I guess it doesn't seem to help pick it up earlier. And I don't think most, you know, it's done very much, you know, outside no. of a trial setting because it doesn't seem to help. But it does also get into the issue that Daniel brings up. Do you keep screening for ILD? You know, you got your, your patient on three years. Are you still you know, looking at her lung, at the patient's lungs, uh, are you, he wants to know about echo. Do you keep doing that at three years? Yes. Yes. We definitely do echoes every three months. Um, but you know, it's really about listening to the patient, hearing their symptoms. I mean, that's get The patient will be your first early warning sign. And together with the CT, um, CT scans, we're getting part of routine restaging. Our radiologists are very good and they will comment on, signs of pneumonitis or ILD. And if there's any signs of it, I would certainly would suspend treatment. If it's a grade one, send the patient over to pulmonary, have an evaluation before resuming. Uh, but if they're symptomatic, then we have to permanently stop the treatment, unfortunately. And, um, you know, John went into uh, ILD and the various studies and you know, I know you can't see this, but uh, he goes into it in his talk. Uh, Tony, before we get in a little farther into ILD, I want to just take a breath and also talk about it, the so-called acute chemo-like effects. 
what your experience is with that, what kind of preventive uh, anti-emetic strategy do you use, Tony? And when you aggressively support people, how does it how does it play out acutely? So I mean, we so we do we do, and a quick word about ILD. Just keep in mind that most episodes of ILD you're gonna see sooner, but you can still see ILD even a year plus later. Mm -hmm. It's less common, uh, but I totally agree with John that you know symptoms are the ones that drive your force. Regarding you know the toxicities overall, you know this is again a lot of the toxicities that we see with trastuzumab, the roxtecan, are actually chemotherapy related toxicities. So pretty much, you know we treat this uh, 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 as uh, chemotherapy. So you know, you're going to see drops in the blood counts. You will see which we just monitor. Uh, you will see a nausea, vomiting, which we pretreat in our institution. You know, we use uh, 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 palanocetron, um, uh, you know, as part of our uh, preventive measures. But you can use any of your standard, uh, you know, and, and standard uh, uh, take home with you uh, nausea pills and standard uh, diarrhea uh, control. So really, in that sense, you know, we're 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 treating this as as a chemotherapy infusion, as as iron, as a fulfiri, say, as an iron tecan, because it's a it's a topos, I mean, isomerase inhibitor. So that's you know for uh, for a preemptive as well as uh, a reactive. You know, for the ILD, there's frankly nothing that can prevent ILD um, other than uh, early uh, uh, early diagnosis uh, again through assessment of symptomatology early intervention, and as John uh, mentioned and others, as you see here on that table, uh, that uh, uh, if this is symptomatic enough, then you can discontinue the drug. If grade one, uh, you may still uh, be able to re-challenge the patients after treating them with steroids. Now, steroids uh, are uh, a part of the treatment, so we hospitalize the patient, treat them with steroids, give them oxygen uh, if they essentially end up with severe moderately severe to severe ILD. With severe ILD, you know, these patients may end up actually, in, will end up in the ICU. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, some may even get intubated. Uh, and many patients, some patients may recover, but many patients will uh, essentially be on oxygen for the rest of their lifetime. So uh, I was thrilled when we got back the results of the survey when I saw this slide, because, you know, frankly, ever since uh, TDXD sort of got out beyond breast cancer, I see all kinds of, pe you know, lung people, GI, uh, GU, and and not the same kind of, I mean, breast, you ask them what they do, they all say the exact same thing. I wasn't hearing that, but this is the story. This is the breast story. If you have symptoms, you're going to have to stop. So the idea, because that's great, too. So right. the idea is what they're trying to do is pick it up at grade one when it's only on imaging. But if it gets to grade two, they stop. So I'm, you know, it looks like at least this group here um, buys into, to me, what is sort of the breast uh, approach. Uh, There's another question. We are curious what people uh, see in terms of alopecia. It sounds like even though you see it, it's not, and we hear this from the breast people too, not as much uh, alopecia as you see with actual chemotherapy. So finally, we've got actually 90 seconds left here, John. So I want to ask you what you're excited about for the future, and particularly because I talked to Tony about Zanidatumab, and he goes through that in his talk. To me, it was like, hey, I think I want to be using that drug. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? And also, John, getting back to our earlier thing, would you expect Zani to work in a patient with a RAS mutation? Is it like trastuzumab, pertuzumab, or more like TDXD? Yeah, so Zani Zanidatumab is is structurally very similar to trastuzumab and pertuzumab. It hit similar targets as those two antibodies, but here it's combined in one. Um, the the uh, data suggests high response rates, long progression free survival in patients with biliary tract cancers that are HER2 positive, um, as shown here in this waterfall plot. I suspect this will be FDA approved, though we'll find out later this year, I believe. Um, and in terms of, you know, whether there's a role for it, absolutely, it, it, it's a very good option for those patients. It also is active um, in some other phase one studies, active in colorectal cancer and upper GI cancers, and it's being studied in upper GI cancers as well. However, there are two potential weaknesses with this therapy. 
The first is that if there is a RAS mutation or a BRAF mutation present, I would not expect this therapy to work. I say that based on data out of my pathway, which show that um, those mutations do rescue the tumor from um, targeting the receptor directly. The other potential limiting factor of this therapy is it's an antibody. It's a large molecule. It will not cross the blood-brain barrier very efficiently. So there you could imagine that uh, tecatinib, trastuzumab combination or trastuzumab drix tcan may be more active for patients where you're concerned about central nervous system metastases. So is it a great drug? Yes. Will it have a role? Yes. But, but you know, it's important to know the, the strengths and limitations of these therapies. And we may have noticed a press release that just came out, the FDA approved amivantanab, another bispecific hitting two pieces of the EGFR molecule, approved now as an alternative to osimertinib. I don't know how many people are going to use it instead of osimertinib, but right. the data is there. And so the principle of this type of bispecific is already established. So, Tony and John, thank you so much. You clarified so many things that have been confusing, at least to me and I'm sure to our audience. <laughs> Audience, thank you for attending. Come on back next week. We'll see what we can figure out about neuroendocrine tumors. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Tony. Thanks, John. Have a thank good you. One. Thanks, Neil. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.